Hey Cycle One TPAers, welcome back to TPA Cafe. Welcome back to our Real Talk series where I'm taking you through each of the templates, talking you through each, and just giving you an idea of things that need to happen, uh, common misconceptions, common errors, reasons that students get condition codes and things like that. And just how to basically create a strong project. Obviously, at the end of the day, you have to be the one to go out there and plan a great lesson and, and film a great lesson, but I'm going to do everything I can do to help set you up for success so that you would know exactly what you need to do and that things are clear for you. So here we go. This is a sample lesson plan template, step 1B for cycle one, and you can use this lesson plan template or you can use a lesson plan template from your university. It's completely up to you. Just so you know, sometimes what happens, depending on your university's lesson plan template, is that not all university lesson plan templates will incorporate all of the same details that this one asks of you. And so you can absolutely use your university's lesson plan template. I have I work at two universities and at one university, most of my students use this template. And at the other university, someone has adapted the university lesson plan template to be in more in alignment with this lesson plan template for the TPA. So it's really up to you, just uh, wh whichever inspires the most confidence in you, go with that. And um, here we go. So for the sample lesson plan template, you are gonna have the title of your lesson. So whatever the topic is, your subject area, your grade level, um, the time frame of your lesson, this is uh, vital right here, your California content standards curriculum framework. So right here, it tells you um, that you need your current California content standards and um, your current California ELD standards. And those are easy, easily Googleable, Googleable, Googleable. That's, that's the word. I'm not sure that's a word, but they can easily be Googled basically. And I know that you, you I'm sure all of you know your you know, what your current California content standards are, where to find them, but you do need to write them out fully for the purpose of this document. So you're going to probably want to pull them up for sure. Also the ELD standards, you're going to want to pull that PDF up for sure. If you are a multiple subject candidate, you are going to be using the Common Core State Standards for either ELA literacy slash literacy or math. If you're in a TK classroom, you're going to use the Kinder Standards for Common Core State Standards for ELA slash literacy or math, which it states here. If you are a secondary candidate, you're using your current California content standards for your content area, obviously. So you need to look up that document and you need to pull the whatever standards that pertain to your lesson. Go ahead and pull those standards. You're going to need the number and you need to write out the full standard. A lot of students, not a lot, but several students have gotten condition codes because they don't write out the full standard. It's really, really important. I just had students recently in remediation for just that thing. So... Make sure you're writing everything out in full. That's huge. And then your content specific learning goals. And um, I'm gonna say it again for the folks in the back, the content specific learning goals need to be grounded in higher order thinking. And here's why I say that. You are gonna have to talk about how you are eliciting higher order thinking from your students several times in this project. So you're also gonna need to show it in your videos. So beginning with a learning objective that is grounded in higher order thinking. Here's an example. Students will be able to, whatever comes after that too, needs to be a higher order thinking verb from Bloom's taxonomy, from Webb's depth of knowledge, or if you wanna look at a document, a matrix that combines those two together, you can pull up Karen Hess's cognitive rigor matrix. And whatever, whichever verb comes after, the students will be able to, should be more or less a verb that is higher order thinking, because that's how we wanna begin our lesson, with a strong, well-crafted learning goal that's grounded in higher order thinking and it's going to get that's going to elicit that critical thinking from our students so if you need to pull up those matrices to to check out which verb you want that's going to be you know most relevant to the lesson you're about to teach then absolutely do that um having a strong and you can look up smart goals and i have a youtube video about smart goals but having a, a strong learning objective that's specific measurable attainable, relevant, and time bound. It's just, I, I, I can't say it enough, everybody. It is the basis of this lesson. Your learning goals set the foundation, much like the getting to know your students sets the foundation of the rest of your TPA. So does having strong learning goals that are grounded in higher order thinking. If you have a learning goal that's grounded in lower order thinking, it's gonna trickle into all of your TPA. Starting with this document, 
then going on to the learn the lesson plan rationale following into your videos in, in your reflection aptly it just is it's going to follow you throughout your entire tpa so please 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 create a strong learning goal you don't need like 12 learning goals in this in this lesson i mean it's a it's one lesson so i'm going to say it's just a former teacher evaluator one to two strong learning goals is perfectly is perfectly fine um you know, if we're being realistic, our students going to be able to meet six learning goals in one hour long lesson or oftentimes shorter than that? Um, probably not. So it's not going to look super impressive if you, you know, the more learning goals you write, just have a couple of really strong ones and that's going to be great. Here, California ELD standards. Oh, how important this is, my friends. So right here, so you have the ELD standards where it asks for you for that to for you to write cite that here, and then you have your ELD goals down here. And then they have an example of how to write both of these right here in the green box. This is a version, this is new to version five. They didn't have these examples in version four. So if um, you were working on other templates or something before, this is new. So you need to pull up the California ELD standards and English language development standards, and you're gonna cite right from this PDF, and this is exactly how you cite your standards with the part, the letter, the number, and they give it to you exactly. This is exactly how you should cite them. They give you sample learning goals. How do I craft an ELD goal from this standard? They give you two strong examples right here. This lesson was, I believe, for a third grade ELA lesson, but yours will be, you know, for your, whatever your content area is. And, and this is, um, this is a very, these are, I mean, this is it. This is the ultimate cliff note. They give it to you right here. So cite your ELD standards exactly this way and your ELD goals. Here are two strong examples. And um, I said this in the getting to know your students real talk video, but if you're a cycle one candidate, you must have at least one ELD standard and at least one ELD goal if you have English language learners in your class. Sorry, if you have, if you do not have English language learners in your class, if you, whether or not you have English language learners, you must have at least one ELD standard and one ELD goal, regardless of whether or not you have English language learners in your class. That's what I meant to say, sorry about that. Um, then we go down to the content of the lesson. Based on student assets. Wait, I'm, okay, I'm gonna do a think aloud, just humor me for a minute. Wait, hold on. I talked about my student assets in my getting to know your students document. This would be a great time to restate or remind myself and maybe the assessors of what I did learn about my student assets in my getting to know your students document. And then building on that, making the connection to that, what do I expect my students to deeply understand about the lesson? This is a great opportunity to reflect back to, oh yeah, what are the student assets I talked about in my getting to know your students document? And then using those assets, what do you expect students to deeply understand about the lesson you're teaching? And this deeply understand, this deeply understand when i think of deeply understand i think of critical thinking so because really if we're doing very lower order thinking or rote thinking rote memory rote knowledge there's not a lot of depth there um and there's nothing wrong with starting with lower order thinking you know another day at the beginning of a unit or something else but in this lesson they're really looking for you to showcase that you can get students to think deeply think critically and so Referring back to student assets, how do you, what do you expect students to deeply understand? How are they going to dig into your lesson and really get to the meat of it? I'm not a mediator, so that's not a great reference for me, but you know what I'm saying. What do you expect students to retain after the lesson and use in future learning? Because, you know, you are going to, you don't maybe know this yet, but you will in step four, if you've looked at that, those templates, um, you are going to be connecting this lesson to future, to like the future lesson what are you going to be teaching next basically so you know what do you expect students to retain and then really be able to use in the future and you know i for me this really means what are you going to be what are they going to be able to use in the future yes for your for their future learning and also because really everything in learning and education is really building right it's everything is building on something that we previously learned ideally so, and then just in future learning, in real, in real the world experiences, you know, in real making for students to make real life connections to your lesson, um, and then be able to use obviously in, in the near future. So you're gonna state that here and just, you know, be really specific here. 
this is, I, I don't want you to be confused by, or not confused, what's the word? I don't want you to be, don't be fooled by the fact that this is a, a narrative and not a regular lesson plan. This narrative calls for you to specifically um, in depth, in an in-depth way, give very specific evidence, answer each of these questions. So when this is based on student assets, I absolutely would be addressing the student assets portion in, in my answer here. I'm not going to gloss over this and just talk about what do I expect students to do. I, you know, I'm going to remind myself and the assessors what I know about student assets and then how that's connected to this. So you need to answer every question in every prompt specifically giving specific details and evidence um, from in, in all of your answers. So, so I know it can seem when there's a narrative that you're just sort of answering questions based on how reflective you are. And it's true, part of that is true. But a lot of this really just needs to be, it needs, this is an evidence package. So you need to give specific and detailed evidence for each of these questions. What misunderstandings or misconceptions do you expect students might have from the lesson? This is a really wonderful question that's based on the teacher performance expectations of anticipating student misconceptions. And what's so cool is when you can do this, when you can think of the lesson you're about to teach and you can anticipate what might confuse students about this lesson, you can fix those things you know, or make things more clear, facilitate the student's learning and things like that before you deliver the lesson. So it's almost like reflecting on the lesson before you teach it. And it's such an amazing thing to be able to do as an effective teacher. So, you know, really exploring what are those misunderstandings or misconceptions do you think they might have? Um, and then really thinking about how you're gonna be addressing those things when you deliver your lesson. What knowledge, skills, abilities, higher order thinking? Oh, there's, oh, there it is, higher order thinking. And academic language development do you expect students to have after engaging the lesson? Friends, my friends, this, this right here. If you started this lesson plan, template or your or even if you're not using this template if you started with a lower order thinking learning goal you're not going to be able to answer this question and this is just the first question of many that's going to ask you about higher order thinking so beginning with you know having a strong learning objective grounded in higher order thinking lets you answer this you know lets you answer this question and really dig in so what do you want them to be able to know at a deep level? We've kind of already touched on that already. And then in terms of academic language as well, um, after engaging in the lesson. Because ideally, you'll teach this great lesson, the super effective lesson grounded in higher order thinking. And students are going to be able to do a lot of things with that information because they're going to, you know, they'll have higher retention if they engage in critical thinking. They'll be able to apply the learning to something else in future lessons. Um, they'll have a certain level of academic language development because of your effective teaching. So you're going to explore all of that here. Okay, assessment, assessment for the win. What essential questions will you ask to determine if students are not yet meeting, meeting, or exceeding the learning goals of the lesson? So we really need to now move into assessment. Um, various types of assessment, lots of formative assessment, lots of checks for understanding. and. Here's where, if you were my students, and some of you are, I really ask that students, this is not just for the TPA, this is just in general. I really ask students to think about a variety of ways they can check for understanding in, in also using checks for, or doing checks for understanding that are eliciting evidence from students, like evidence of student learning. So I personally, this is just me, I ask my students to refrain from things like thumbs up, thumbs down. Um, and the reason for that is that we don't have evidence of student learning necessarily, like concrete evidence when we do things like a thumbs up, thumbs down. So what this is really about, and that's not what this question asks anyway, this is what essential question, what questions are you going to ask students during the lesson? What are you going to ask them to say and do and think about and make their thinking visible? That making thinking visible piece is really important. So. How will you know if they are meeting your learning goals, not yet meeting or exceeding the learning goals? What kinds of things are you going to ask them, particularly you know, throughout the lesson and toward the end of the lesson? And include those questions here. Be really specific about what you'll ask them and how, not only what you'll ask them, but how that will inform you as to whether or not they're not yet meeting, meeting or exceeding the learning goals. What will students do to demonstrate achievement of content during the lesson? So this is related to this question around 
By the end of the lesson, you're going to want students to have demonstrated whatever your learning goals were from above. So what will students do throughout and by the end of the lesson to show you that they 100%, like you 100% know that they demonstrated the achievement of content, they demonstrated your learning goals, or they didn't demonstrate your learning goals. What will you do? Concrete things, concrete steps, be really specific here. Vague is not a word you want associated with your TPA. So be very specific, give very specific evidence, give the details. And if you can, you know, really make the connections to how what you're doing is being is effective for your students. How will you know that content specific goals are being met? Um, so what will students do? Uh, this, these are all kind of related, just kind of so, so if you feel like you're kind of being a little repetitive, a little repetitive is normal, but, um, but they are, they are different questions. So how will you ask that your content specific goals are being met? Um, this is a lot like this question above, but you can say, you know, what specific, um, what specific activities, tasks, um, are students doing, you know, instructional strategies, things like that. What are they engaging in to show you that their, the learning goals are being met? So that one, again, be very specific about the teacher moves, the activities and, and all of that. If you're, um, when you answer this question, um, how will you know that ELD goals are being met? So for the ELD goals, same thing. You're going to just be really specific about what activities are they doing? What are the checks for understanding what's happening to ensure that you know that the ELD goals are being met? Um, it's very similar to the questions above. The best thing I can say for you here is just to give really specific evidence, questions, um, activities you're doing, ways that you're checking for understanding if kids are doing, if the students are doing collaborative practice, if you're doing small group, think pair shares, you know, whatever it is that, that the activities that they're doing, you know, make, make sure that you describe them in detail here. So structured learning activities. We see it again, here it is, based on student assets, based on student assets. What activities will the students be involved in during the lesson to support, engage, challenge their achievement of the content specific learning goals? Kind of similar to what we just saw above, but again, you were, you were talking in depth about what activities, what instructional moves are you doing as a teacher to engage these delightful students to support them, to, to challenge them and help them achieve your content specific learning goals. And again, you have this opportunity to, to refer back to based on student assets and kind of re kind of state, well, based on what I learned about my students and their assets, which, which are dot, 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 here's what I'm doing to engage them in the lesson. And, and, and really, you know, don't be shy about the specific teacher moves that you're doing to engage them in the learning and why you're doing them. So be really metacognitive about this here too. So based on student assets, what, will, what activities will FS1 and other English learners be involved in during the lesson to support engaged challenge? Their achievement of the ELD goal, same thing here. Go back to what you know about FS1 and um, you're getting to know your students and FS1's assets and learning needs and how are you gonna use that as you choose the instructional moves and activities that you're gonna do for your students as they, um, so that to help them and support them achieve their, your ELD goals. How will you group students and manage group work? So whole class, small group, pairs, individual to support student learning. For this, it's the, you know, the more intentional you can be, the better. One thing I'd like to caution you about um, is that sometimes students expose student vulnerability, sometimes teaching candidates expose inadvertently student vulnerabilities when they talk about group work and they'll say things like, well, I'm grouping kids based on behavior or which obviously we don't want to do that. We don't want to, you know, group the kids that aren't behaving together and group the, I mean, we just, we don't want to seem like we're tracking kids, for example. And so how will you group students and, and will you start a whole class and then go small group and then will you do pairs and why? Um, so, you know, remain really asset focused when you do this and very intentional about why you're grouping in the way that you're grouping and just make sure that it makes sense with the lesson that you're describing, the lesson that you're about to teach. How will you engage students in higher order thinking? Here we see it again. So if you're not, if you if you're not starting your lesson with a higher order thinking learning goal, you're not going to be able to actually even answer this question. So we're already seeing how starting with a lower order thinking learning goal is going to affect our TPA starting right from the beginning. So if you have a higher order thinking learning goal, you're going to immediately be able to dig into how you're engaging students in the critical thinking. You know what activities are you doing, and be really specific about 
the spe- be really specific about the actual activities that you're doing. Again, the teacher moves, the collaborations, the um, the the different things that you've chosen for students to do. You know, if they're doing tech and if they're engage if they're doing stations and centers and things like that. Um, just be really specific about why you, you know, how you're engaging them in higher order thinking and what that looks like and, and how, how that's taking place. Um, that's going to be really important. And then finally, instruction to support learning. So this is a little bit, you're, you're probably going to find that you may, you may repeat some things that you said earlier, but what instructional strategies will support student learning through multiple modalities? And UDL is a great I repeat, a great thing to mention here around how you're supporting students in the multiple modalities of universal design for learning. And so being really explicit about that here is going to be really helpful. And then what resources, materials, and or educational technology will you or your students use during the lesson? And then what adaptations, um, aside from UDL, beyond UDL, will you and supports will you build into the lesson if there are any extra accommodations or modifications that you will make um, for your whole class for specific students for example um, like if you have an fs2 that needs assistive technologies what will you um, how will you support fs2 in that for example and again we want to be really careful not to say anything that's going to do anything or say anything or plan for anything that's going to expose student vulnerabilities but just remain really supportive and asset focused in our learning um, in all of the teacher moves that we're making. So this um, is the this is the optional or the sample lesson plan template for the TPA. And if you found this helpful, please like, subscribe, share, comment down below. And I will see you next time when we do our lesson plan rationale.